Okay, so the, this physical ministering of grace was gathering up money and then taking it to the needy church. And so what we're going to think about is what were the character qualities of the, the men who would be delivering that physical gift to meet that physical need? What were those, the character qualities of those men? And then that applies to us because we would say, well, our job is to deliver grace, which is, in this case, it's a physical gift, it's money. In our case, we're saying we're going to deliver the gift of, of, of the gospel, we're going to deliver grace to those in need, to the poor people who don't know the gospel. Okay, so that's the picture, that's what's happening here. Now, for a little bit of context, just keep your place in 2 Corinthians, and let's look at Romans chapter 15 for a second, because this um, Paul explains this collection for the saints um, in, in a new and kind of different way that I had never seen before. So Pastor Jay pointed us, this out. Romans 15, verse 25 says, so Paul is speaking, he says, but now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. So he's traveling, he's gathered up money, and he's saying, I'm going to Jerusalem to deliver this money. Like he's, I'm going there to, to minister to them. And he says, for it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia. So when you hear Macedonia in your Bible, think of the churches in Philippi and in Thessalonica. So Paul, in Acts chapter 16, gets sent into Macedonia. Here's the Macedonian call, goes in to Macedonia, goes to Philippi, goes to Thessalonica. Those are the churches of Macedonia. So he says, um, it has pleased those people to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. We just read in 2 Corinthians 8 how the church in Macedonia was very generous. They gave beyond their means. And Paul is in Romans, he's now explaining what that looks like. He's saying, he's commenting on that. So he's saying that that's what's happening. Verse 27, it says, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, if you remember back to Acts chapter, chapters 1 and 2, the church is in Jerusalem. Like this is where it started. Pentecost happens and the Holy Spirit comes down and the church starts in Jerusalem. Okay, so the saints that were in Jerusalem basically started what we know of today as the church, right? So they start it. So Paul's saying that all of the Gentiles in the world had benefited by the spiritual work that happened in Jerusalem. This big spiritual work happens, and we know God said, you know, Jesus told his disciples, well, it's going to start in Jerusalem, and then it's going to go. It's going to spread. So Paul is saying in Romans, that has happened. Spiritually, the Gentiles have benefited from the, the saints that were at Jerusalem. So what Paul is saying is, because they've done that, because the Gentiles have benefited spiritually from what happened in Jerusalem, those same Gentiles should get out their wallets and send money back to the poor saints at Jerusalem. So saying, they, these, this group, this core group of people ministered uh, spiritually, and now, you know, as a beneficiary of that, the Gentiles should say, we're going to minister back to you physically. It's a cool picture, right? It's like a really neat picture. It's a I think we think of it really practically in terms of a local church. We think, well, we've been ministered to spiritually by our pastors, by our leaders, by missionaries. We should give physically to help support them do that work. Um, super practically, Mike Renault spoke uh, the second, first or second morning of Mission Focus or first night. So Mission Focus in my mind is like a big blur right now. So if I like say it's a, the wrong day, then like every day has been Groundhog Day for like five days in a row. I think if you've been at the conference or even like you've, you've experienced this, right? So every day is Mission Focus. I don't know which day this happened. Either way, Mike Renault gets up and he's, he needs money. Like, so let's be, like, let's be really practical about this. Mike Renault has ministered to many of us spiritually. Is there a physical way now that we could help support him? Yeah. Pray about that. He's looking at $4,000 a month shortfall when they move into their new building. Yeah. At the cheap rate. Like, that's the, that, that, that's the best case scenario. So, you know, he put the need before the church, said we're looking for 40 partners at $100 a month. That's not 40 $100 gifts one time. That's a commitment for three years to give $100 a month. Pray about that. Maybe that's exactly why Pastor Jay spoke on this thing. Mike's ministered to us spiritually. 
He's ministering to poor saints, poor spiritual people in Boston. Let's get behind that physically. Let's get behind that. I would just charge you to pray about that and think through that. So, let's talk about some, some points from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So, a key attitude that I think we need to have that, that comes through in this passage is that we see that the Macedonian church was willing. In 2 Corinthians 8, I'm back at 2 Corinthians 8, verse 3, he says, they were willing of themselves. So the willingness, the attitude of I'm willing to give, I'm willing to help, I'm willing to serve comes first, and then God presents the opportunity and and we can meet that opportunity. Um, A key principle, that something that just really, I I thought was super powerful in verse 4, the, this collection for the saints, it's more than financial support. Okay, it is about financial support, and that's important, but here's what the financial support does. If you look at 2 Corinthians 8, verse 4, the second half of the verse, he says, and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. When we give physically, when we give our money, we are participating in the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. It's more than just a gift. It's actual fellowship. Sometimes I think we have a shallow definition of fellowship. It's like we eat a donut and drink coffee and talk about the chiefs, and we call it fellowship. And I love, I don't like the coffee part, but I love the donut part, and I'll talk football all day. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. But I think to call that true fellowship is maybe a bit of a stretch from the biblical definition. Biblical fellowship is... We're sitting down in the boat and we're rowing together. We're doing the work together. And I would just put a plug in, like, this is, this is a cool thing that happened, kind of a personal thing that happened this week. One of the best parts about Mission Focus for me is that I got to serve alongside people from, from Kaya and Class A Spana, and I got to serve alongside people from other churches, and I got to serve alongside people from Faith Fellowship and from all over the place. And I feel like I'm closer to those people than I've ever been before because we were working together, because we were involved in ministry together. So I would just put another plug in. If you're not involved in in ministry on a regular basis, jump in. If you want fellowship, if you want like true in the trenches, get close to people, man, come here on Saturday morning and clean and put these chairs up with a group of people. Like cleaning. All right. Wow. God's good, right? Like, look at that timing. But we become more unified when we serve together, right? The differences in, in age, the differences in race or language or ethnicity, they don't matter anymore. We're serving for a common goal. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's gathering money from Gentiles to send to converted Jews to help support them. Think about the differences there, right? Like the people in Jerusalem are literally converted Jews. They grew up as Jews. They became Christians. They're poor. Paul's taking money from Gentiles from other places in the world and helping to support them. Man, their hearts are knit together in that. And that's when, that's I think really when when our hearts are knit together with one another is when we're serving. And we can eat donuts and talk about the chiefs later, but let's serve together too. Like that's a, it's a really powerful thing. The second key attitude before we get to some of our blanks is we see it in chapter 8, verse 9. He says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So this, this attitude is to make oneself poor so that others may be rich is to be like Christ. So when I make myself poor in physical things and spiritual things, when I make myself less so that others can become more, that's to take on the attitude of Christ. Christ's attitude was he had the riches of heaven and he left all of that to lower himself to become a man. He, he gave that up. He gave up richness to be poor so that we could be rich. So when we give up our riches, and it's not always just physical things. I think it's physical. I think it's spiritual things. It's our talents. It's our time. When we give that up to make others rich, and we're, we're becoming like Jesus. In those moments, we're becoming like Jesus. Pastor 
Andrew in one of the breakout ses sessions, Andrew Wong, he, he's, he was talking about his procession of kind of the process of going from FOI um, here, leading FOI, to now God has him in Asia leading a church. And he was talking about the different steps that he's taken in his life. And he said, you know, each kind of big step of obedience in his life has required another, um, another sort of layer of dying to himself, is how he said it. And so um, becoming poor for Andrew looked like giving up business opportunities, um, giving up, you know, good jobs and money and physical things, and even leaving behind a spiritual work in FOI so that he could, he made himself poor so he could go make some other people rich. What a cool example, right? Like we all have the opportunity to do that in our lives. So Paul sets this up in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, there's these churches that have need. We're gathering money. We're going to send it to him. And then the rest of the chapter after verse 9, he lays out these character qualities. So we started at, by asking the question, who is qualified to deliver God's grace to those in need? And um, on Thursday night, Wednesday night of the conference, Pastor Jay laid out some, um, some of these qualities. So get your pen ready. I'm going to have to go through these kind of quick and... Um, there's no PowerPoint, so good luck with spelling. No, they're not that hard. So, number one, God uses people who take action based on His Word. So God uses people who take action based on His Word. We hear the Word, we receive the Word, and we do something. Faith without works is dead, right? Like, we, we hear, and then we act. So we take action. Number two, God uses people who are proficient in the gospel. So God uses people who are proficient in the gospel, even in a physical work, even in a, I'm just take, I say just, I'm taking money and moving it to a different area. Right? Like I'm these people are delivering this money to Jerusalem. They, to, to be qualified to do that, they needed to be proficient in the gospel. They needed to be able to express the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number three, God uses people who are confirmed by the churches. God uses people who are confirmed by the churches. Right? So God gives us spiritual authority, gives us churches, gives us pastors, gives us leaders. Um, one, of the main, one of the things they do is they will confirm us in ministry. And if you are ready to take a missions trip this year, one of the steps to that is you apply and the pastor's look at that application and they say, he is spiritually, she is spiritually ready and in a place. We confirm that person to go do that work. Number four, God uses people who are blameless and honest. So blameless and honest in the sight of God and man. God uses people who are blameless and honest in the sight of God and man. If you look at the character qualities of a, of a bishop in like 1 Timothy chapter 3 or in the book of Titus, the first thing Paul mentions is that a person has, must be blameless. So blameless and honest in the sight of God and man. The fifth one, God uses people who are proven diligent in many things. It's often said this week about, you know, people, it's a missions conference, right? So it's, hey, we're, we're sending people around the world or we're sending people nationally or internationally. And we often say this, that, that if you're not doing the work here, if you haven't proven yourself diligent here, you're not going to get confirmed to be sent somewhere else. Right? So God uses people who are proven diligent in many things. And the last one is God uses people who are validated by current leaders. So this is similar to the confirmed by the churches, but the last one is God uses people who are validated by current leaders. So we'll have, a few, we'll have time at the end to reflect on these things. As we, as we get into our discussion. But let's move to night two because there's a, I think there's a nice connection here. So on, on night two of the conference, Brian Clark talked about virtue, right? So Pastor Jay on the first night talks about character and then Brian emphasizes virtue and he, he went through the story of Esther. So let's go to the Old Testament. Let's go to the book of Esther chapter one and we'll set the scene here for... For the second night. 
All right, so in Esther chapter 1, just kind of to set the stage, what's happening is the, the king, King Ahasuerus, he's throwing this huge party. Right, he's throwing a party that's like months and months long, and it's this giant feast. And the reason that he needs to throw this party is because he wants to start a military campaign. And in order to run that campaign, he needs money and he needs men. So he invites all of his lords in, he invites his, his like upper level leaders from all over the kingdom in to show off all of the riches. He's like, look at all this stuff we have. Don't you guys want more? Like, wouldn't it be good if we had more of this? He's trying to inspire them to, to give money and to send their men so that he can start another war. Well, what happens in, in chapter one of this story is that the king instructs his wife. So his wife is Vashti. He instructs Vashti to come out to the party and to present herself before everyone to show off her beauty. And as you know, in the story, Vashti decides she's not going to do that. She's like, I'm good. I do not want to partake in that. So there's an uproar, right? The king is upset, and the king calls his men together. And he's like, what should we do about this? And all of the men, the leaders, they decide that if they allow Queen Vashti to not listen to the king, if they allow her to hide herself, then it's going to set this precedent all over the kingdom that women and wives don't have to listen to their husbands. So they're, they're scared of that. Like they're, they're worried that you know, feminism is going to take over and women are just going to run free and they're not going to listen to their husbands and it's going to be this bad deal. So the king is left with a decision. His decision is, let's remove Vashti out of the picture. Out of the picture. Let's, she's done, right? We're going to take her out. Now, the Bible's not clear if she gets killed or if she just gets sent away to exile. Um, either way, Vashti's out of the picture. So here's, that's our story. There's a party. Vashti refuses to show herself. The king says, you're gone. This is not a good precedent. And then he actually sends a, a message out to everyone saying, um, don't be like Vashti. All over the kingdom, women must listen to their men. Like he sets that up as a law. So what does this mean for us? Here's what this means for us. This is a doctrinal picture, right? So Vashti, she's a picture of the church right before the tribulation. Okay, And we don't have a time to, to get into all of that, but Vashti as a picture of the church, she's going to be removed, just like the church is going to be removed in the rapture, we're going to be taken out, and then there's a great tribulation time. You see that in the story of Esther, Vashti is taken out, and then there's a great persecution against the Jews, where almost the Jews are just really close to being completely exterminated, it, had Esther not stepped in, you, you know, you could have seen that happen. So that's what's happening. So right before the tribulation, right before the rapture, right before Vashti leaves, doctrinally, we're in this time called Laodicea. And so um, Pastor Brian went through the rest of like, Esther chapter 1 to show us the characteristics of Laodicea. Um, and I want to talk about a few of those really quickly. Okay, so let's, let's fill in our blanks for what is Laodicea. Because if we understand the time that we live in, think that what, what Pastor Brian helped us to see was that we know the time we live in and we know how it's going to end. Knowing those two things should affect how we live. Like we should be aware of what's going on and aware of what's going to happen. We know the future. We know, it's, we know how Laodicea is and how it's going to end. That should affect how we live and it should affect our focus on virtue. So the first thing about Laodicea, and I think as we talk about these, you'll say, wow, I see that in our world today. Number one, Laodicea is a big show. A big show. The king is throwing this party in Esther chapter 1, and he's just showing off his riches. He's showing off his beauty. He wants to show off his wife. It's just a big show. right? And think about our lives so often in Laodicea are just a big show. Even our church lives become a, a show. A show of our own righteousness or self-worth or godliness or whatever it is we want to present ourselves in a certain way. And then think about outside the church. We literally have an app called TikTok that's just shows. Sometimes funny, but often really awful. 
Did you, so this is a side note, but did you know that, so China, the Chinese company controls TikTok, and they have this like algorithm that filters to American subscribers videos that are shorter and I guess I would say dumber in content. And then the, the videos that are getting sent to the Chinese viewers are longer and more like intellectually stimulating. So the next time you're on TikTok, think about that. China is filtering to us and our children videos that are taking our attention and making us dumber and filtering to their kids videos that are making their kids smarter. So don't watch the show. Don't let your kids watch the show. It's, it's bad news. So Laodicea is a big show. Number two, Laodicea is about pleasure. Second Timothy chapter 3 talks about what, what things are going to be like at the end. And in verse 5, Paul says, At the end, people will be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Mm. Our lives are all about pleasure, right? Our society is built on pleasure. We're, our society is built on just numbing people with pleasure so that they're just partakers. Satan is all about giving us pleasure so that we're not really part of God's mission. Because being part of God's mission isn't always pleasurable in a fleshly, physical way. Spiritually, it's the most fulfilling. But physically, it's hard. It hurts. Laodicea is all about pleasure. The third thing is that Laodicea is about religion. It's about religion. I think this goes with the, the, the showiness of Laodicea. I think, you know, we, so we know that we're saved by grace through faith, but sometimes I think we can base our relationship with God on kind of what we've done for Him lately and, and how well we've served Him. Um, and the, we kind of measure ourselves against each other in terms of like how much we're serving and our, or maybe how much we're giving. It becomes a religious sort of act rather than a relationship. The fourth characteristic of Laodicea is that it is disobedient. Laodicea is disobedient. So when Queen Vashti was called to present her beauty, she refused, she disobeyed. And often when we as the church are called to present God's beauty, we hide God's beauty rather than show it. We're, we're given an opportunity to, to, show, to, to share the gospel, to show God's love to someone, and we quench the spirit and we hide it. And that's what Vashti was doing. That's what Laodicean lukewarm people tend to do. Number five, Laodicea is deposed. Deposed. What this means is that, there, that Queen Vashti's crown was taken off of her head. She was no longer queen. And that is what's going to happen to us. So I know we often talk about like being part of the rapture. And I think that's a cool way to go. Like if, if I could get to heaven and be like, yeah, I was one of those that got taken in the rapture, that would be really awesome. The flip side of that is that the rapture means that the church age has failed. So when we, we look in the Bible at the different dispensations throughout the Bible, the different time periods that God has, has broken up the Bible, well, each dispensation ends with some failure. And this is the, the dispensation of the church age. It's going to end in the failure of the church. So we're going to be deposed. Laodicea is going to lose its crown. Right? And the last one is that Laodicea disappears. So part of that being deposed is that we as the church, as the church age, will become irrelevant. We will, we will disappear. We will be gone. So here's what we know. We know these things about Laodicea. And I think if we take these points and look in the world, we would say, yeah, it's true. We also, the last, the, one of the things we know is that Laodicea will fail and that will, it will disappear. So we know, like, I love MBT. I think MBT is a great church. I think we're reaching the nations. I think God's used it to, to change people's lives and all over the world, right? I think it's great. But ultimately, we are part of the losing team. Like, ultimately, this thing goes down 
with the church age and the church losing. Now, we lose the battle. We don't lose the war. Ultimately, God wins the war against Satan, right? It's, he's going to take care of that. But ours is, our, our time ends in failure. So here's the point that Brian brought up in the kind of the key lesson. He says, what we believe about the future and what we know is going to happen, we know that we're going to lose, what we know about the future will determine how we behave today. And it will determine, and it will define victory for us. So Brian pointed out that in the church age, our definition of victory is all about virtue, right? It's all about how we serve the Lord. And he gave the analogy of, you know, when you're a kid and people tell you like, well, you're playing sports and they tell you like, well, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. And he told that story and I I fully relate to that because like when I was a kid, it was actually all about whether I won or lost, like I don't know, if you have kids, and I, I think it's good to teach lessons on good sportsmanship and character and virtue, but man, winning is way more fun than losing. Like, I think we can all agree on that, right? But for the church age, we're going to lose. So it really matters how we play the game. It really matters how we fight, right? And, and so knowing that we'll lose the battle... The question is, how are we going to fight? And are you still willing to fight? Brian said, you know, if we spread his name while we dishonor his name, then we still lose. And the true test is going to be if you are serving for the honor of his name. So that takes us to the last night. So Pastor Jay talked to us about character, right? The character that it takes to be a minister of grace and then Brian talked to us about how we fight that battle. Like, as we're ministering grace, how do we minister grace? In what way do we do it? Virtue is the most important thing, right? And then in the battle, while we're fighting virtuously, that leads us to our last night. So Pastor Sam talked about hiding. His message was called Stop Hiding. So there's this great battle for the souls of men, and there's this great battle for the kingdom, And we get to partake in that through our character, and we get to partake in that in a virtuous way. We should partake in it in a virtuous way by by living for God's glory. But the tendency and the biblical pattern is that we want to hide. So let's look through this biblical pattern that's established in Genesis. The first part of the pattern is that God gives a clear command. So in Genesis chapters, you know, one through three is where we really saw the story. God gives a clear command. He says, don't eat of the fruit, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the first thing. So we have this battle that we're engaged in. We we need good character. We need to be virtuous. But sometimes we get called into the battle. We get a clear command from what God wants us to do. And then the second thing that happens is that Satan attacks. Man, so God gives a command. He says, Adam and Eve, here's what you need to do. Here's your job. And also, don't eat this fruit. And then in comes Satan. One of the, the word, the, one of the words used to describe Satan is that he's subtle. And one of the definitions and one of the ways that word, is, that word subtle is also rendered or translated, and this is interesting, it's, it could be translated as reasonable. Okay, so Satan appeals to our worldly reason and our worldly logic. And pretty often, steps of faith are the opposite of logical by the world standards. So Satan comes in and appeals to, so God's going to give you something to do. God's God's burning in your heart to give $100 a month to Mike Renault. And Satan's going to come in and say, yeah, but what about that new car you wanted to get? Yeah, but does it really make sense to send $100 to someone? Like, you could put that in your savings. Hey, your kids are going to have to go to college someday. That's reasonable. It's reasonable by the world standards to save my money. And I think there's some good biblical principles about saving money as well. So I don't want to, I'm not saying that. But Satan's going to apply to the logical, reasonable part of you when God is calling you to step out in faith. It doesn't make sense for a team of people to move to Asia to give up their jobs 
reasonably. It, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And that's what Satan wants us to believe. That's what Satan wanted Eve to believe. Eve, it doesn't really make sense not to eat that. Why would you not want to be like God? That sounds reasonable to me. If I'm Eve, I might be partaking. So Satan attacks. What happens when Satan attacks often is that man disobeys. That's the next step in the pattern. So man disobeys. After the disobedience, our next step is that man hides in fear. Man hides in fear. So that's where we get. Pastor Sam pointed out that all hiding in the Bible is a result of fear. And sin, which is unbelief and rebellion and fear, that ruptures our fellowship with the Lord. And fear separates us from the will of God and it places us in hiding from God. I think the most, one of the, the saddest questions and times in the Bible is when God comes into the garden. He's like, Adam, where are you? God knew right where Adam was. And, but Adam was hiding. Adam had disobeyed and in fear went into hiding. So what's the result? Catastrophe ensues. That's our last point. Catastrophe ensues. When we have a clear command from God and we we let Satan's attack lead us into disobedience and into hiding, what happens is that God's will is interrupted and that catastrophe ensues. The paradise and the perfection of the garden was lost on that day that Adam and Eve partook of the fruit. When we hear from the Lord and disobey His command, it's catastrophe for us, and it's catastrophe for others. The flip side of that is the story of David. When David is called into battle with the Philistine, with with Goliath, David obeys. David kills the Philistine. Later on, the rest of the the Jewish army, the rest of the Israel army, is also slaying giants. So when we disobey, it causes others around us to go down. It causes others around us to be hurt. When we disobey, our children are affected, our families are affected, our co-workers are affected, but when we obey, it rallies the troops, and together we're stronger in that obedience, and we stop hiding. So we saw through three messages how God, God works, right? So God's God lays out in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 8 through our first message that, that it takes a certain character, it takes a certain character of person to deliver his grace. And then, and then Brian talked about how, you know, trying to relate that character to our virtue, right? We have to fight the battle, even though we're going to lose, we fight in a virtuous way full of character, and we must, um, we must avoid the hiding and the running from the Lord that can be so easy and so common and so prevalent. Let's pray together, and then John will come up and lead us in some discussion. Father, thank you for this morning. Thanks for mission focus. God, your word is true and right and good, and I pray that as we think about these things and reflect on them, that you would lead us, that your spirit would would convict and would encourage us where we need it. Um, Give us a good rest of our time in your word, in Jesus' name.